Um, I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight. Um, on behalf of myself, uh, Rajat, and the entire RFS, I'd like to welcome um, Dr. Galani here. Uh, Dr. Galani gave us a fantastic talk uh, in June on pulmonary embolism as our first chapter of the critical care webinar series, um, which was initially done um, in collaboration with the ICU service line, which is currently headed by um, our Shantanu Warhan Pandey. And um, we're really happy to have him here again for a second talk um, because his, his um, first talk was so well received. Today he's going to be speaking about shock, and uh, I won't get into too much more details to spoil anything, but um, we're very happy to have him. Dr. Galani is, was my ICU professor, ICU attending uh, as an intern last year, and I learned a tremendous amount from him just through bedside rounds and our discussions, and, um, and I'm thrilled that he's here uh, to speak with us tonight. So, um, Dr. Galani, welcome. Thank you, David, for the nice introduction once again, uh, and thanks everybody for joining for this talk. We're going to talk about shock today. Um, it's a pretty wide topic, so we wouldn't be able to cover um, the management of shock, but we'll go over some clinical pathophysiology, which is uh, really relevant in managing these patients. Um, so brief overview. So first we'll talk about the definition of shock. Uh, then we will go into um, how, how can we make this diagnosis quickly because time is essence here. And uh, then we will talk about some of the clinical, biochemical, and hemodynamic parameters which are relevant in these patients. And uh, last part will be focusing on classification of shock. So uh, interestingly, definition of shock um, is pretty complicated. Uh, it's a life-threatening generalized form of altered tissue perfusion associated with inadequate oxygen utilization by the cells resulting in organ dysfunction. Um, so the key here which I would like to emphasize is altered tissue perfusion. Uh, when we talk tissue perfusion, we mean how much blood is flowing through the tissue per minute. Um, so the, the word here is altered and not just reduced because it depends on the kind of shock. In a lot of forms of shock it will be reduced, but there are some kinds of shock like distributive or septic when it may not necessarily be reduced, it may just be not matching the demands of, the, of a particular tissue. Uh, next, uh, this, this perfusion results in inadequate oxygen utilization by the cells, which leads to cell death sometimes and organ dysfunction. So um, organ dysfunction, if we wor work quickly and we are able to reverse the shock state quickly, maybe temporary, or it, if it is not reversed quickly enough, it can progress to irreversible organ dysfunction. Uh, it also depends on the organ you're talking about. For example, skin and visceral tissues are less sensitive uh, than tissues like brain which are highly sensitive to even few minutes of shock state. Um, so the keywords in the definition of shock are altered perfusion and organ dysfunction. I would like to emphasize that there is no mention of blood pressure in this definition, and that's very, very important. It's highly clinically relevant because blood pressure may not drop in initial stages of shock when uh, the organ function is actually reversible. And if we keep on waiting for the blood pressure to, to drop, we may have missed this window where the shock was actually reversible and organ dysfunction could have been prevented. Um, so we'll go over some uh, physiology at the microcirculation level. So um, this is kind of an artery, uh, divi arterial dividing into several capillaries, which eventually join to form the venial. Uh, and this capillary bed is in a given tissue. So blood flow or perfusion, which is represented by Q here, uh, through this tissue depends on the pressure gradient, which is P1 minus P2. And it also depends on the resistance to the blood flow in this tissue. So um, it will be directly proportional to the pressure gradient and inversely proportional to the resistance. It's kind of like Ohm's, Ohm's law of circulation. So this... Um, the important thing is here is at a given pressure, you can have 
very high flow or no flow depending on how much resistance you have. So pressure doesn't tell you anything about perfusion to the tissue. If you apply this same principle to the whole body, uh, the perfusion to the whole body is kind called cardiac output, uh, which is measured in liters per minute, and um, that and the pressure gradient across the tissue, uh, whole body is mean arterial pressure, and if we divide it by total peripheral resistance, that kind of the same principle that we talked about earlier, but it is applied to the whole body. So let's say somebody is in initial stages of shock, and even if their blood pressure drops a little bit, that kind of triggers this reflex mechanism in our body which is called baroreceptors which are located in the aortic arch and carotid sinuses. So even a slight change in blood pressure, these things send signal to the brain uh, which is located in the medulla. Medulla sends signal to the sympathetic chain and increases the sympathetic discharge which in turn causes vasoconstriction and vasoconstriction increases uh, the peripheral resistance. So this vasoconstriction maintains the blood pressure. So initial stages the blood pressure will be preserved but the vasoconstriction because there is increased resistance the flow through the tissues especially the non the so-called the non-vital like skin and viscera will be remarkably reduced already uh, but the blood pressure is normal. So the purpose of this reflex is to maintain blood flow to the brain and heart the vital organs but all other organs like skin visceral organs are already not getting perfusion during this time. So if we keep waiting for the blood pressure to drop, these tissues are already in a state of shock which, are, which, we, which we are missing the window of treatment by waiting for blood pressure to drop. So um, key thing here is normal blood pressure can be misleading. So in terms of identifying shock early in your patients, we have to remember the keywords altered tissue perfusion and organ dysfunction. So um, organ dysfunction, the quickest way at bedside will be altered mental status, decreased urinary output. So urinary output is about 0.5 ml per kg per hour, which is about um, roughly about 40 to 50 ml per hour for an average size uh, individual. Uh, if it goes down, that will be an early sign of shock. Cold clammy scan will be another early sign. Uh, but also remember that early stages of shock will have, may have normal or even sometimes elevated blood pressure. Um, so whenever you think of shock, you should think from the perspective of um, perfusion and not so much, don't rely too much on blood pressure. Uh, I will give you some examples which will emphasize that low blood pressure is not always equivalent to shock and a normal blood pressure doesn't rule out shock. So a classic example is a liver cirrhosis patient. These patients have low blood pressure, their normal systolic is 80 to 90 but they are not in shock, they are walking around with these blood pressure because their total peripheral resistance is very low. So they are still getting perfused, right? So they are in low blood pressure state but not in shock. You must have seen some young individuals, especially young athletic individuals who have systolic blood pressures in the range of 90s, sometimes even 80s and they are just fine, right? Um, also as we talked about early shock may present with normal or even elevated blood pressure. Um, in hypovolemic shock, this has been studied really well. So if you have an animal, an animal example, experiments that were done like long time back, when you remove 20 to 40 percent of the blood volume of the animal, during this, even if the blood loss is equal to 30 percent of blood, total blood volume loss, their blood pressure is still maintained. And the, uh, the tissues like viscera, skin, and uh, even kidneys may actually be already injured at this stage. So also the final example which is very relevant in resuscitation of the patient is I can raise the blood pressure of patient by giving him, him a vasopressor or a vasoconstrictor agent but that doesn't optimize their perfusion and it just raises the blood pressure and the patient may still be in shock. So um, just to emphasize the blood pressure point, the, the task force, uh, European task force on shock came out with this guideline which kind of emphasized all the points I just made that the presence of low blood pressure should not be a prerequisite for defining shock. Compensatory mechanisms may preserve blood pressure through vasoconstriction, wild tissue, perfusion and oxygenation already decreased significantly. So how do we 
how do we identify patients in shock? So clinically, we talked about altered mental status, cold climates can decrease urine output. Some very important biochemical markers are lactate and mixed venous O2 set. I'll talk about each one of the, those in more detail um, in the course of this presentation. Then some hemodynamic markers, which we not necessarily measure in every patient of shock, but may be required depending on the severity and the complexity of the patient. The hemodynamic parameters are cardiac output, blood pressure, heart rate we measure all the time, of course, and systemic vascular resistance. Cardiac output uh, may be low in a lot of forms of shock like um, hypovolemic, cardiogenic, obstructive, or maybe high in distributive shock or septic shock. Systemic vascular resistance, we, we, don't have a re, we don't really measure this clinically, but we always calculate it based on the formula we talked about earlier in this presentation, uh, the relationship between cardiac output and blood pressure. So we have the blood pressure, we have cardiac output, and we use those two numbers to calculate systemic vascular resistance. And it's high in most forms of shock, including cardiogenic hypervolemic obstructive, but it's extremely low in distributed shock. So all clinical um, things have some limitations, and as is the same is true for clinical markers of shock, altered mental status. So in ICU setting, um, a lot of patients are just sedated. They are on benzodiazepines, they are on opiates, which may be leading to the altered mental status. Um, a lot of my patients are old, so they, they have some degree of dementia, sometimes even advanced dementia, so I can't really use this marker a lot of times. Um, drugs, alcohol, uh, cocaine, um, you know, all those toxins. Uh, some people may have encephalitis, like uh, HSV encephalitis, and they may, may be altered because of that. Similarly, low urine output, if somebody is already end shade renal and was on dialysis, Urine output is not going to be a reliable marker in them. Um, as we talked about earlier, uh, in initial stages of shock, the organ dysfunction is reversible, but if the kidneys have been not getting perfusion for too long of a time, they may already go into acute tablet necrosis. At that point, urine output will not be a reliable marker. Then there can be some technical errors, like Foley is obstructed, or you know, uh, it's, the nurse didn't record the urine output accurately, all those things are there. And cold clammy skin, initial stages of septic shock, the patient may be warm, they may have high fevers. Um, environmental exposure, uh, limb ischemia, if, uh, for example, somebody's uh, popliteal artery is blocked, the leg will be cold even if the whole body is not in shock, just that particular tissue is in shock. So moving on to the biochemical markers, uh, the first one we'll talk about is lactate. So lactate has been very well studied in shock, and it's hi highly relevant. Um, it has been known for ages now, almost 40 years, that lactate correlates with mortality in patients with shock. So if somebody comes to, to ICU with very high lactate, let's say about 10, they have really high mortality, touching even 90 to 100%. Also something uh, that we know about lactate is the clearance of lactate. So for example, somebody came to you with a lactate of six, and one hour later their lactate is down to one, they may do better than somebody who came in with lactate of six, and one hour later still have a lactate of six despite the resuscitative efforts. Um, so the normal cutoff value for lactate is two. It is metabolized predominantly by liver and kidney, almost 60% by liver, 30% by kidney. And this is a picture, this is a graph which um, I, sorry, um, I got from a paper published in 1970, just to emphasize how long do we have this information from. So there are two papers, this, this data is from two different papers, the black curves and the white curves are from two different studies. X-axis is lactate, Y-axis has mortality. So if the lactate on arrival to ICU is more than 13, there is almost 100% mortality. This data still holds true. We are 50, 40, 50 years down the lane, but this data holds true. At very low lactate, the mortality is lower. And as the lactate is increasing, at 9 to 13 range, it's already 90%, 4.5 to 90, it's almost 70%. The lactate is correlating with mortality. This data is still applicable to our patients. 
some people have even gone for, as far as to say that lectin is a better prognostic marker than hypertension. Um, the, the data comes from patients in sepsis who have hypertension without elevated lactate compared to patients who have hypertension and elevated lactate. So patients who have isolated hypertension without lactate elevation, their mortality is low, about 8%. But if you have hypertension and lactate elevation, the mortality touches about 43%. So once again, everything comes with limitations. So there are different causes of lactate elevation. Um, they're broadly classified as type A, type B. Type A is the lactate that's formed by the tissues when there is inadequate oxygen utilization by the tissues. Type B is also formed by the tissues, but in the absence of inadequate oxygen delivery. So type A is the lactate formed in the stages of shock because there is inadequate oxygen utilization. Type B may be formed because of other reasons, which we'll talk about. B1, which is subtype of B, is because of associated underlying diseases, for example, leukemia lymphoma. The cells in leukemia lymphoma make more lactate than normal cells, so these patients may have elevated lactate. Thiamine deficiency, thiamine is needed for lactate conversion to glucose, which is gluconeogenesis, and if there is less thiamine, the lactate may be elevated, seen commonly in chronic alcoholics. Lactate is cleared by liver and kidney, so in patients with liver and kidney disease, uh, lactate may be elevated. And if uh, they have normal lactate, they may take a long time to clear lactate when they're in shock. Um, a lot of drugs, this is very common, very commonly seen in ICU. Uh, beta agonists like epinephrine, uh, if you're using epinephrine as your vasopressor, they may have elevated lactate despite not being in shock. Albutrol, somebody presents with asthma, uses a lot of albutrol, they may be in shock. Um, alcohols, methanol, chronic alcoholism, salicylate. Um, I think the other drugs relevant here are metformin, isoniazide, um, and antiretroviral drugs. B3 is a very rare form which it's not that much clinical relevant. This is because of inborn errors of metabolism. Moving on to our next biochemical marker which is mixed venous oxygen saturation. So um, what is mixed venous oxygen saturation? That's the oxygen saturation of blood from the pulmonary artery. So uh, it's kind of all the blood that's returning to the, to the heart from the, after it has already circulated to the body, but is the saturation left in that blood, right? So the ideal way to do it is to place a swan gans, obtain the sample from pulmonary artery, and check the oxygen saturation in it. The way to kind of understand the relevance of it, there is an analogy that works as an ice cream truck analogy. Let's say there is a neighborhood with, uh, with 100 kids who want an ice cream in, in a day, right? And there are five um, ice cream trucks, each with 100 ice creams that go through the neighborhood each day. So if, each, uh, if the kids get 20 ice cream from each truck, 20 times five, all the get, kids get the ice cream just by getting 20 ice creams from the each truck and the trucks will be left with 80 ice creams. So that leftover 80 ice creams in each truck is kind of mixed venous O2 set. So if someday, for example, the three, three truck drivers got sick and only two trucks came in the whole day, then kids will get 50 ice cream from each truck and they will be left with 50. So that kind of represents, represents a low flow state. So there is less there's less blood flow, more oxygen will be extracted from the blood, and less will be left over on the pulmonary artery side. If, on the other hand, there are suddenly more kits in the, in, this, in the neighborhood, that's kind of increased oxygen demand by the tissue. The same number of trucks may go by, but they will be left with less, less oxygen. The final analogy here will be, for example, if the trucks cannot be loaded with ice cream, they could not go to the factory or whatever and they started with less number of ice cream, let's say 50 and each, so they just had 5 times 50, which is 250 to begin with, and 100 are taken by kids, so 150 will be left, which is 30 per truck. So that kind of represents what happens in severe anemia or desaturation. There is less loading on the arterial side. So 
we don't really place that many swans nowadays. So the way to we, we check this this value is by central venous oxygen saturation, which is a kind of which is kind of used as a surrogate for mixed venous, which is not exactly the same thing, but close. Uh, the reason being in pulmonary artery blood, the the blood from the car carotid coronary sinuses also mixes in which is lacking in the superior vena cava blood. So um, what mixed venous represents is the difference between the delivery and consumption. Um, normal value is about 65 to 75. So this is um, formula of oxygen delivery. You don't have to remember the formula, but kind of know the components here. So the oxygen delivery is represented by DO2, which is rate of oxygen delivers in ml per minute. Depends on cardiac output. So if the cardiac output is zero, there will be no delivery to the tissue, even if there is oxygen oxygenation of the blood. Uh, also, the amount of oxygen in per ml of blood depends on the hemoglobin, because hemoglobin is the major carrier, and the oxygen saturation. There is a very small component of the partial pressure of oxygen, which is multiplied by 0 0.003. So even if this number is 100, 100 times 0 0.003 is 0 0.3. So this is almost negligible. So major determinants of oxygen delivery are cardiac output, hemoglobin, and oxygen saturation. Um, so this kind of pictorial representation of mixed venous to set. So from the lungs, oxygenated blood is delivered to the heart. The oxygen saturation in this blood is about 95 to 98. Hemoglobin is normal is about 13 to 15. If you fit these numbers in the delivery equation that we talked about earlier, multiplied by cardiac output, you get about 800 to 1200 ml of oxygen delivered per minute in the whole body. Tissues use about 225 to 275 and rest is left over in the blood, 525 to 975, which leads to the saturation of 60 to 80 on the arterial, on the venous side. So if there is a drop in cardiac output or a drop in hemoglobin or drop in saturation, there will be less delivered, tissues will extract the same amount, so left will be left over, right? But if there is an increase in cardiac output, there will be more left over on the venous side. So interpretation of mixed venous O2 sat or if it is high, it can be because of increased delivery, which, uh, which is very rare because we don't really keep patients in a state of hyperoxia or very rarely use hyperbaric oxygen as ever. So not so much clinically relevant. Um, or there is decreased demand, which once again, we don't really use that much neuromuscular blockade uh, in ICU. Uh, hypothermia of still use somewhat um, so the most common cause of high SVO2 will be sepsis or distributive shock or severe liver disease. Um, for low SVO2, which is because of decreased oxygen delivery, all these causes are kind of common because of decreased hemoglobin, anemia, yes, it happens very commonly, right, hemorrhage. Hypoxemia happens commonly. Decreased perfusion because of cardiogenic hypovolemic or obstructive shock, all these are common, right? Um, increased oxygen demand, once again, not so common because we don't, even if seizures happen in ICU, they, we don't let people seize forever. A shivering, we control them. Hyperthermia, all these factors we control aggressively. So these are not so common. So low SVO2, the most common causes will be cardiogenic, hypovolemic, obstructive shock, hypoxemia, and anemia. High SVO2, most common causes will be sepsis, distributive shock, liver disease, and hyperthermia. So next, we'll talk about classification of shock. So there are four classes of shock, um, which are cardiogenic, hypovolemic, distributive, obstructive. We'll talk about each one of them in more detail. Um, this pie diagram here represents kind of what, is, what are the um, percentages of shock in IC, uh, in IC population, what kind of shock is most common. So look at the numbers here, so 62% of shock is distributive in ICU population, right? Distributive from septic, right, which is the most common cause of distributive shock. 
but 4% is because of distributive shock because of non-septic reasons. 16% is hypovolemic, 16 is cardiogenic, and 2% is obstructive. Obstructive shock is because of um, cardiac tamponade, PE. We'll talk about those in more detail. Um, the reason to this, this pie diagram is interesting is because I want to emphasize how um, even general physicians or almost non-IC physicians can treat shock in a lot of patients without, without much you know, complicated clinical skill requirement. How do we treat septic shock? Fluids, antibiotic, maybe pressors, right? Uh, hypovolemic shock with fluids, maybe blood transfusion. Obstructive shock, if there is a pneumothorax, put a needle in it, drain it, right? Or identify a PE, right? Cardiogenic shock is probably the only window where some patients will need uh, revascularization for an MI or some mechanical uh, support in rare cases, right? So a lot of patients, 62 plus 16 plus 2 plus this 4 percent, can be treated by just general information about shock, fluids, and somewhat about pressures, right? So that's about 80 to 90 percent of the population of shock. So first we'll start with hypovolemic shock, right? So hypovolemic shock is easy to understand. It's uh, because there is inadequate circulating volume of blood. So um, uh, there are two major classes of this, which is hemorrhagic and non-hemorrhagic. Hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic uh, can be an external bleeding, like a trauma patient, operated bleeding, um, lower or upper GI bleed, vaginal bleeding, right? Uh, internal bleeding, always um, something to keep in mind. Um, a lot of times I have to involve IR for these kind of bleeding, like somebody uh, having a retroperitoneal bleed, uh, somebody bleeding into their thigh, uh, intraperitoneally. Um, rarely a ruptured aortic aneurysm, not so common in medical ICU, more common in cardiothoracic ICU. Uh, the focus on, uh, in this uh, cases will be to control the bleeding and also, of course, uh, fluid and blood transfusions as necessitated. Um, then there can be non-hemorrhagic causes of uh, hypovolemic shock. Non-hemorrhagic can be subclassified when there is an absolute loss of fluid from the body or the fluid just moved from the intravascular comp compartment which is required for perfusion to the extravascular and interstitial compartment. So the absolute losses can be um, uh, high output fistula in a GI tract, a lot of vomiting, diarrhea, uh, nasogastric tube suction, um, renal losses, uh, very common DKA, very commonly seen in ICU, a lot of diuretic administration, evaporative losses from fever, more commonly when somebody is going for a uh, long surgery with open body cavity. Migration of fluid from intravascular to extravascular, is commonly seen in pancreatitis, burns, trauma patients, right? So um, going back to the table we were talking about the markers, so remember lactate is elevated in all causes of shock will be elevated. From our truck analogy in hypovolemic shock, there are kind of less trucks going into the neighborhood, so there will be more, less ice creams left on the truck, so less mixed venous, so to say. Uh, blood pressure, remember, may be normal in initial status. Eventually, it will get low. Cardiac output will be low. Vascular resistance from the better reflex that we talked about. Since the blood pressure is falling, that kind of triggers the better receptors, which causes the vessels to constrict because of sympathetic discharge. Um, something I want to emphasize here that not every patient with shock will need a cardiac output or a systemic vascular resistance to be measured. Um, we kind of measure these things when we are not sure what the diagnosis is or if the patient fails to respond to initial therapy. Uh, next um, classification is obstructive shock. Very interesting, it's, it's seen only in 2% of patients, but if you pick it up, your patient can recover very quickly if you make the right diagnosis. So that, that's the importance here. So it's because of mechanical obstruction to normal cardiac output. Um, can be because of cardiac tamponade. I will talk about tamponade in more detail. From pulmonary thromboembolism, massive PE, air embolism, tension pneumothorax. We'll talk about each one of these in a little more detail. So cardiac tamponade, kind of pectorally represented here. You have a pericardium which is very stiff. If there is a fluid collection, the pericardium can't expand. 
and the fluid kind of compresses on the heart chamber so they can't fill up with blood so they can't pump anything. It's kind of represented by an echocardiogram here. So um, this is the pericardium. This is your right atrium. And see how the right ventricle is completely collapsed here. And left atrium and left ventricle are expanded. So this collapse of RV, a diastolic collapse of RV or RA, is considered to be diagnostic for tamponade. Most common causes of tamponade trauma, blunt trauma to the chest wall, MI, aortic dissection, tumors, vasculitis. Right? So um, something important to remember in tamponade is it's not the volume of blood that's important because if, if it's an acute bleed or an acute uh, collection of fluid, even small amount like 200 ml can cause tamponade because pericardium cannot stretch. But if it accumulates over a long period of time, there can be massive amount of fluid without resulting in tamponade. So the volume of effusion alone does not dictate the clinical course as much as equity for its development. Pulmonary embolism we talked about in the last case um, scenario. So this is a main pulmonary artery with the saddle embolism going into the right and left main pulmonary artery. So there is acute obstruction of the RV, which is kind of shown in this echocardiogram. This is LV, RV. Normally, RV is much smaller than LV. Look how big this RV is, which is because of acute obstruction. So there is acute right-sided heart failure resulting in obstructive shock. Tension pneumothorax, again, um, these patients can improve remarkably if you make the right diagnosis. So um, a picture representation here. So if there is air entering this right side of the pleural cavity, collapses the right lung, the SVC and IVC are collapsed because of all the pressures. Mediastinum is kind of compressed. So since these are compressed, no blood can enter the heart. So there is no filling of the heart. Um, it's a clinical diagnosis, right, which is kind of indicated in this picture here. So you have no breath sounds on the right side. There is increased resonance, hyperresonance, right? So we shouldn't be waiting for a chest x-ray. There is tracheal shifted to the left. There is hemodynamic compromise. So if you see this uh, needle, immediate needle um, decompression followed by chest replacement will save the life of the patient. So going back to our table, lactate, remember all cause shock, lactate is elevated, mixed venous O2 sand, there is less delivery of blood to the tissues, so there will be less oxygen left in the blood. Blood pressure may be normal initial stages, but eventually will fall. Cardiac output will be low. Systemic vascular resistance will be high. Cardiogenic shock, um, remember it's about 16% of our patient population. Um, it's not always just because of pump failure. There are other causes. The most common, of course, is myocardial infarction. But the pump failure can also happen because of cardiomyopathy from viral, postpartum cardiomyopathy. I've seen a couple of cases of shock from this. Uh, septic, um, alcohol-related toxins. Um, there can be also valvular diseases like severe aortic stenosis or aortic dissection. Um, there can be issues with filling of the heart like atrial myxoma, mitral stenosis, uh, acute aortic or mitral regurgitation cardiac dysarrhythmias, ventricular septal defect, a lot of beta blocker or calcium channel blocker overdose. But the most common, remember, is going to be an acute MI. Um, just to give some numbers, so um, in a study in 65,000 patients who were admitted for acute MI, about 5% develop cardiogenic shock, but they have a really high mortality of about 60%. Um, coming back to our table, lactate, all cause shock, elevated, mixed venous O2 sand, because the cardiac output is low, it's low. Blood pressure may be normal initially, which eventually will fall. Heart rate is going to be not too helpful. If it's a beta blocker overdose, it will be low. If it is an inferior wall MI, it will be low. Other causes may be high. It can even be normal. Cardiac output will be low. Systemic vascular resistance will be elevated because of better receptor and sympathetic discharge. 
moving on to the most common cause of shock or type of shock, distributive shock, right? So um, this is different from all the shocks we have talked about. Everything we talked about so far had low cardiac output. This one is high cardiac output. That's why in the definition of shock you cannot say reduced perfusion. You have to say inadequate or uh, inadi altered perfusion is the right word there. Um, and there is low systemic res vascular resistance, which so far we have all the uh, shocks we talked about and high resistance. Uh, most common type is septic, about 62% of the population. But there can be non-septic causes. Um, in trauma population, neurogenic shock, if there is thoracic spinal cord injury, uh, that's an area where sympathetic chain is located. These patients will be bradycardic and in shock because of vasodilatation. Anaphylactic, very easy to recognize because of penicillin maybe, medication, insect envenomation. Um, there is a lot of airway swelling in addition to distributive shock, um, like tongue swelling, lip swelling, um, airway obstruction. Liver failure um, is very similar to distributive shock. It's uh, the whole, all blood vessels are dilated. Uh, Graves disease patient having thyrotoxicosis. That's that's kind of hyperdynamic circulation, same thing. And adrenal insufficiency will cause the same picture. So um, slight difference here, lactate will still be elevated, but the mixed venous O2 sac will be high. Blood pressure maybe normal initially, eventually will fall. Cardiac output is high, which is different from all the shocks we talked about. And this is the basic pathology here, which is decreased uh, systemic vascular re resistance. One thing which we should talk about a little bit is, even in sepsis, there is some degree of myocardial depression. It depends on how severe your sepsis is. So if some, a patient has very advanced and severe last state sepsis, their myocardium can be extremely de depressed, both the ventricles right as well as left. And in end stages of septic shock, cardiac function can be severely compromised and these patients may look like they are in cardiogenic shock, but they are actually sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy is what they're going to. So all the tables put together, so type of shock is on this one. So remember lactate, irrespective of what shock you are in, will be elevated. Mixed venous O2 set will be high in distributive shock, low in other causes. Blood pressure may be normal in initial stages of all shock, but if, of course in advanced shock it will be low. Cardiac output is high only in distributive shock, but low in everything else. Remember in advanced distributive or septic shock there is cardiomyopathy, so it will eventually fall there too. Systemic vascular resistance is high in everything except for distributive shock. So. How do we differentiate one shock from another? Because as you see, there is a lot of overlap in this table, right? So majority of patients, uh, I will say based on the initial history, the physical exam, and basic lab tests, CBC, chemistry, EKG, chest x-ray, lactate, SVO2, you will be able to establish a diagnosis. We'll call, call, talk about some case scenario to make that point more clear. Kind of mentioned this earlier, not every patient will need all the complicated hemodynamic measurements. Actually, a lot of patients will not need that, especially SWAN GANs. We rarely do that, if ever. We are kind of going away even from arterial lines and central lines to some some degree. Uh, bedside echo is becoming highly, highly useful study. Um, it's very quick, can be done in a couple of minutes. It's non-invasive. You can do it several times on a given patient to see if their patient is responding. Um, also, an important thing to remember is same patient may have different forms of shock, and we will give you some examples on that. So just to emphasize um, my points here, this is once again from Euro European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, um, some, some statements. We suggest that when hemodynamic assessment is needed, echocardiogram is the preferred modality to initially evaluate the type of shock as opposed to more invasive technology. So we are kind of going away from invasive testing and just going on the basic biochemical bedside evaluation, maybe echo if you can do it. In complex patients, however, 
if somebody you're not sure what kind of shock they are in or they have multiple types of shock or they have multiple comorbidities or if they're not responding to your treatment then we go to more invasive texts in like swan gans catheter to kind of evaluate what type of shock they are in and to help resuscitate so we'll go over some quick case scenarios to re-emphasize the points we talked about during this presentation so a 40 year old ma uh, male um, and the same patient will be seen on four different scenarios this is a one patient and three hospital days so Mr. Casanova he had alcohol related liver cirrhosis he presented to ED with hematemesis and melanoma. he had three episodes of hematemesis at home one in ED each was about 50 ml of bright red blood also complained of multiple episodes of black colored stool for the last three to four days he's awake but drowsy blood pressure is 70 or 40 heart rate is 90 oxygen saturation is all right respiration is not too bad is a febrile heart and lung exam is unremarkable abdomen is slightly distended does not have any edema on extremities but is cold to touch hemoglobin is only six hematocrit 18 platelets 50 white count 14 with a normal dif differential lactate is three EKG and chest x-ray are unremarkable urinary catheter has not yet been plain, placed UA is negative for leukocyte leukosteres and nitrite so the question here is first question is this patient in shock as we talked about um, the clinical markers are mental status he's drowsy uh, we don't have urine output yet um, he's cold to touch so he meets two out of three already his blood pressure is low so he may actually have progressed to some like medium to advanced stages um, so we'll say yes this and his lactate is three so we'll say yes this patient is shocked without even doing any complicated hemodynamic measurement so what kind of shock when the history is this clear cut he is having hematomesis he's having melano uh, doesn't seem like he's infected his urine is clear his heart and lung exam is normal his belly is slightly distended which may be from chronic ascites but doesn't look like it's acutely anything wrong with it so when the diagnosis is that clear cut we'll call it hypovolemic hemorrhagic shock we don't really have to kind of go into complicated testing for this patient do we need an echo in this patient I will say I will resuscitate this patient give him blood uh, volume crystalloids and uh, see how he responds follow up lactate blood pressure mental status urine output and if he's responding I don't really need an echo on this patient do we need a SVO2 now to get an SVO2 I at least need a central line if not a swan gans so central line is an invasive procedure can has its own risk right so I will even wait on that right now and I will just give him peripheral blood and fluids and see how he responds do we need an A-line, central line, swan gans? Kind of the same answer. I don't think he needs anything other than peripheral IVs for resuscitation and response. See the response since the diagnosis is pretty straightforward here. So, um, luckily this patient, um, it's the same patient, Mr. Casanova. He got admitted to ICU. He got his emergent endoscopy done. He got resuscitated. Endoscopy showed... Um, some esophageal varices which were successfully blended he's not bleeding anymore after all that his blood pressure and mental status improved his lactate cleared um, but next morning he wake up with a fever of one or two he's again confused he's lethargic his blood pressure is again down to 70 slightly tachycardic his O2 set is 98 percent on three liters his lung exam uh, his crackles on right lower lung fields heart is normal, abdomen is distended and tender, urine output is only 10 ml per hour, EKG is normal sinus rhythm, chest x-ray is pending but hemoglobin is uh, 9, remember he had 6 on arrival, he got blood, um, platelets are 50, white count has increased to 18 with 80, 80 neutrophils, U is positive for leukocyte estrate and nitrite, urine culture is pending, lactate is 4. So once again as a patient in shock, let's say yes, here's all the parameters we talked about I don't need further testing to call him call him in shock what kind of shock so he's not bleeding anymore 
it did not have any more hematemesis. Its hemoglobin is stable, if anything. Um, he does have a fever. His urine analysis is showing us leukocyte esterate nitrite. His chest X ray is not done, but he does have right lower lobe crackles. His abdomen is tender. So just looking at that, I have three sources of possible sepsis urine. Abdomen has a situs in serotic patients, so it may be infected. SBP, which is called spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, may have a pneumonia from lung exam. So I will call it distributive or septic shock at this stage. Does he need an echo once again? I don't see an urgency for an echo. Although echo is so quick, I will just may, if I have a bedside echo there, I will just do it. But I wouldn't call for a formal echo by a cardiologist here. Um, does he need A-line, central lines, fongans? What I will do for this patient right now is give him antibiotics and fluids. And if he's still requiring pressors because of low blood pressure, I may place a central line, but I wouldn't really go as far as creating a pulmonary artery catheter or arterial line in this patient. So um, now um, the senior resident who was taking care of the patient called the attending. He agreed. Yes, he's in septic shock. Uh, you should go ahead and treat it. So broad spectrum antibiotics were given. Uh, fluid resuscitation was performed. Peritoneal fluid um, was consistent with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Blood pressure improved, lactate cleared, um, but he lost his IVs and uh, the residents were not able to place it. So they decided to place a central line. And they were placing a right subclavian central line. And immediately after the central line, blood pressure was systolic of 40, heart rate went up to 130. He became unresponsive. There was no bleeding from central line site, and resident confirmed the guide wire was in vain prior to dilatation of the central line placement. Lung signs absent on the right, trachea shifted to left. So <laughs> this picture, once again, just to emphasize that so clear cut, the central line was being placed, which is a rest for pneumothorax. is absent lung signs. His trachea has moved to the left. There is no bleeding. Um, you didn't cannulate the artery. So most likely diagnosis here is a, is a pneumothorax. So do I need any complex? In this case, I wouldn't even wait for CBC chemistry, chest X or lactate, anything. Right? I wouldn't require anything in this case. No need for echo, of course. You will just do a needle decompression and maybe place a chest in here. So everything was done, and emergent needle decompression was done. Right-sided chest tube was placed. Um, he improved right after the decompression. His blood pressure improved. He regained consciousness. Full expansion of the right lung was achieved, confirmed with an X-ray. He was continued on broad spectrum antibiotics for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. He did not have any further episodes of hematemesis and melanoma. Um, however, on the day you decided to discharge him ICU, he was not just to be confused once again and was uh, complaining of mild chest pain. Stat EKG was performed, which showed some T-wave emergence in lead 3. Blood pressure is down to 70 over 30 once again. Heart rate is 100. He was noted to have low-grade temperature, 100.4. Oxygen saturation is 90% on 3 liters. Lung exam um, has clear on the right, but left-sided crackles. Abdomen is mildly descended, but uh, non-tender. Um, also, the right leg looks more swollen than the left. Hemoglobin is still stable, 9 over 27. White count is only 10. Platelets are stable at 50. But his creatinine has bumped up to 2 and BUN is 40. And lactate is 4 again. And this time you had the central line, which got the pneumopathorex, which gave you an SVT of 50, and troponin of 1, and CPK of 1,000. So now this patient became very complicated. Now he can have almost any kind of shock. Uh, yes, he's in shock again because he's confused, his lactate is elevated, uh, his mixed venous O2 set is low. So yes, he's in shock, his blood pressure is low too now. But I'm not sure what kind of shock is he in. He has low weight temperature, he has some crackles on the left side which were not there earlier, his UA is positive, so he may be in septic shock again. But at the same time, he's complaining of some chest pain and some T-wave inversion, so is he having an MI? Also, he has a right lower lip swelling, more than left, which may be a DVT. So these findings can very well be from a PE, low grade temperature, low blood pressure, all those, um, and uh, chest pain. His oxygen saturation is 90. His oxygen requirements have increased to 3 liters. 
So all these findings can be because of an obstructive shock, P, can be because of septic shock, can be because of hypovolemia even, right? Um, so at this point, the diagnosis is not clear. So in this kind of patient, you will need all the studies we talked about. In addition, you may have to do a strat echo to nail the diagnosis. And if the echo can't help you, then finally you will be left with the choice of swan gans catheter. Um, the reason I'm saying echo here is because he's in renal failure. I think PE is significantly possible here. So if an echo shows me an RV dilatation, I may have a diagnosis just by looking at the RV dilatation there, and I may be able to save the life of this patient once again. So take home messages. Um, remember, whenever you talk about shock, think about tissue perfusion, think about oxygen utilization, think about organ dysfunction. Um, also, a very important presence of low blood pressure is not a prerequisite for de defining shock. Um, lactate initial value as well as clearance help prognosticate your patients in shock. Echocardiography is the preferred modality to initially evaluate the type of shock as opposed to more invasive technologies. But if your patient has complex um, kind of shock, you're not clear with the diagnosis, or he's not responding, he or she is not responding, then you may have to do more complex hemodynamic measurements which may require a swan gans catheter. Um, this is kind of very true for, of course, patients with multiple comorbidities, also in post-cardiac surgery patients. Um, so that's it, and thank you for listening, and um, I'm ready for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Galani. That was an excellent overview of shock. Um, definitely much needed for myself as a refresher from last year, and um, I especially like the ice cream analogy. Um, whenever ice cream's told, that that helps me remember everything. So, <laughs> That's good. Um, so yeah, for anyone who would like to ask uh, Dr. Galani questions, please fill in the questions field. Um, I have one from Dr. Vatican Cherry to start things off. Uh, thank you, Dr. V, for the question. Uh, it is: Do you have a MAP goal for septic shock? How much fluid do you initially give, and what pressors, and in what order? Um. All three are very relevant questions and um, are pretty complex, right? Um, so MAP goal, um, to tell you the truth, we, we don't have a defined MAP goal. Uh, usually, we give a number of about 65, maybe 70. Um, but uh, we kind of know that's not true for everybody. Um, so if somebody has chronic hypertension, they live at baseline 150, 160, some people even 180, for them MAP of 65 may be too low. Uh, although, uh, and if somebody who lives at baseline 80, for them 65 may still work. Uh, we don't have any definitive studies which give us a definitive MAP goal. Um, regarding how much fluid uh, for septic shock, that's, that's something I was trying to keep up for the next presentation. Uh, fluid resuscitation is extremely complex. Um, if I have to give one answer here, um, I think we give too much fluid. That's how I feel. Um, we are seeing, I think we have fed in the brain of all of our doctors that shock is equivalent to fluid. So if anything, we are doing over fluid resuscitation. Whenever we do fluid resuscitation, we should at least look at some markers of uh, fluid responsiveness. Um, and only if the patient has at least a few markers of fluid responsiveness, which we'll talk about in the next one, some, the, some which are very, um, well studied at this point will be IVC studies, inferior vena cava uh, studies, or carotid dopplers, or um, tests which, which look at the dynamic parameters. Based on that, if you have any of those positive, then give them a fluid challenge. The fluid challenge at this point can be anywhere from 500 to a liter, um, given over a 30 minute period. And if they are responding to that after the positive test, only then continue with the fluid resuscitation. Uh, the guidelines on sepsis, although, will say about 30 cc's per kg, but once again, that's too simplified. Um, pressors, once again, I was keeping it for the for the next talk. Um, the pressor of choice for septic shock, definitely, that's an easy answer, I will say, is, is uh, still levofed. Uh, 
there can be exceptions. Um, if somebody is uh, in rapid ventricular rhythm, AFib RVR, uh, in that patient, leofed may further worsen it. So in that patient, maybe vasopressin plus phenylephrine may be better. So there's some some um, exceptions, but uh, by far leofed will be winning. Thank you, Dr. Balani. Uh, we'll leave another minute to see if anyone else has any final questions. Okay, we have a question um, from our panel. What is the best way to assess responsiveness to a fluid bolus? Can you discuss how to perform the raised leg test? Yeah. So, um, raised leg test is kind of um, is um, a way to give fluid bolus internally. So when we lay, raise uh, legs of patients, so for example, if you uh, put them in a trendle inward position, 45 degrees, that it's considered to be equivalent to about 300 ml of uh, fluid bolus because the, the, there is increased venous return. Um, there is, the test that you will do will depend on 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 a few things. If, um, if you are ultrasound trained, um, I think the test that you will do is carotid Doppler to look at carotid blood flow. If you're not ultrasound trained and you, you have like limited uh, facilities, then I think um, looking at an arterial waveform for blood pressure may be reasonable but not accurate. Um, looking at heart rate, but all those things have limitations and are not accurate. The best test at this point for passive leg raise and uh, will be will be carotid Doppler to look at carotid flow. Okay, great. Um, we have a question from John Doe. How would you classify shock secondary to CNS injury? I've learned it is a type of distributive shock, but with CNS injury, cardiac output is decreased. What are your thoughts? That's an interesting question, actually. It depends on uh, on where the CNS injury is located to some extent. So um, if, um, for example, you have a spinal cord injury, right, uh, that's that's neurogenic shock, that's uh, reduced sympathetic tone, that those patients are bradycardic, right, and are in distributive shock. Um, if somebody has brainstem injury uh, or, um, you know, brainstem or pituitary kind of region injury, so th these patients get uh, vasopressin deficient. Uh, I had a case recently in my unit who, who was kind of declared brain dead, but, you know, um, still being considered for organ donation. So we were trying to support the patient till that can be arranged. And that patient suddenly dropped blood pressure to about 40. And um, my resident started him on levofed and went up to massive amounts of levofed without any response. But at that point, they just added a touch of vasopressin, just the minimum dose of vasopressin. And the levofed was shut off and the patient became stable. So that kind of tells you that these patients with, with posterior brain, brainstem injury, are kind of very vasopressin deficient and highly sensitive. They're in autonomic dysfunction state. So if you give them vasopressin, they may just stabilize by that. Um, although in advanced stages, they, they are in a state of autonomic dysfunction. And I've seen uh, some very interesting things in, in these patients is at one, one moment they're really hypertensive and uh, they may need a, a labital or a beta blocker to control the blood pressure. The next moment they are, they, you use that and the blood pressure falls. So the simple answer is if it's, it's, um, if it is a spinal cord injury, you are in a distributive shock with bradycardia. If you have a brainstem injury or pituitary injury, you may be, uh, or brain dead patient, maybe vasopressin deficient. If it is a cortical injury, cortex uh, injury, and the blood pressure, if their intracranial pressure is increased, those patients are actually sometimes hypertensive and bradycardic. So those, those are the brain injuries and the response, hemodynamic responses. Okay. 